Hey folks, so what this is, what you're watching right now is uh, a chat with my Patreon. Um, he has a system that he wants to take it to the next level and I want to help him do that. So um, I've been getting a lot of emails and questions uh, like 50 a day and I'm not exaggerating. So I made a Patreon section where you can actually um, uh, support the channel and as well get your answers at one go. So, you know, a 30 minute talk with me on Skype or whatever. And um, uh, and so we're going to do that here. And I don't I don't record every single one of this. Uh, Billy, who, who's the gentleman on the camera right now, um, he has kindly said, you know what? No, uh, you're you're good to film it and put me up on uh, YouTube so that the world can, uh, you know, get some answers out of it as well. So thank you, Billy, for allowing me to film this. Sure. And, and he has a very comprehensive system. Uh, we'll talk about his system uh, later on, but we'll first answer some of his questions uh, going straight into it. Okay, so Billy, uh, ask away and uh, I'll answer. Okay, uh, so uh, I come from a recent upgrade, mm -hmm. a going from all my life with home theaters and now deciding to have a stereo system. Mm -hmm. So I began with the amplifier. Uh, I really don't know why, but <laughs> I began with the amplifier. And after reading and, and uh, investigating a lot and reading a lot of reviews, because there's no chance here to make any type of audition. You're, you're in Brazil, I, right? Yes, I live yes. in Sao Paulo, yes. Brazil. So uh, finally, I selected the Hegel H190. And then uh, I was looking to upgrade my speakers. <laughs> okay, so I didn't, I didn't mess up with that one. So <laughs> I was looking to upgrade my speakers. I had a very old quads, uh, bookshelves. And then I began hunting, 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 hunting. And I was almost going to pull the trigger for Kev R3s. And suddenly uh, there was a chance to buy some pristine Dali Epicon 2. When I mean pristine is that even the guy even had the original packaging of everything. So I felt like it was new. For a real, real good price uh, here in Brazil, half of what it cost new. And uh, somebody told me that those should sound better. I, I'm, I don't know because I've never heard the caps. And I chose that one. And then, well, now I have it. I have the amplifier. I have the speakers. Uh, I listen to Tidal through my computer. But uh, then I began uh, streaming with some small Yamaha, Yamaha WXC50. But I was like, hmm, not good enough. Then I began streaming through UPnP, uh, through the Hegel. Uh, hmm, this is much better. But still, you know the Bob. I think we can go to the next level. Mm -hmm. And then here I am, actually overwhelmed by the huge quantity of options of streamers, DACs, and cables. So I'm yeah. stuck now. <laughs> yeah. So he asked about cables. So we're, we're going to have to talk about cables. So just a warning out there for some people. But uh, oh, I'm, fine. Yeah. I'm fine with talking about cables. It's fine by me. Um, so your main question, I guess, uh, that you sent me was uh, you want to upgrade a, uh, a streamer, a separate streamer um, and, yes. and a DAC. And uh, I see here that you said that you wanted to get the Hegel HD 30 DAC, which retails for 4,200 USD. Um, now, are you aware that when you get a DAC for the Hegel H190, you can't stream it? Uh, you can't use the streamer inside the Hegel anymore. So you have to get a separate streamer as well. Are you aware of that? Oh no. <laughs> yeah. So so when you when you get a DAC, right? If the DAC doesn't have a source built inside, so if, if it's not a streamer and a DAC, then you can't stream it into the Hegel because Hegel doesn't have digital out or you know uh, USB digital in. That doesn't have any kind of um, uh, way for the streamer to feed itself back into into the uh, system if you buy if you uh, bypass it. Okay. So the 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 way it works is you need to have a separate streamer to go with the DAC. So you're not only looking so at... I, 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 sorry, I wasn't aware mm -hmm. it didn't have a streamer or I, yeah. I didn't think about that. So in theory, mm -hmm. in theory, 
Mm -hmm. I could use the Yamaha streamer, which has an optical out mm -hmm. into the Hegel HD30 if I go in that direction. That's correct. Um, so you, all you need is you need, so when you're thinking about upgrading a DAC for the Hegel, and this goes out to everyone else as well, um, you need to be using a separate streamer as well, because the Hegel is working as a, remember, as a source and a DAC inside the unit. Um, so to upgrade the DAC, it's like you need to have the source first because, you know, source comes first and then the DAC, right? So uh, you're looking at two upgrade options here in steps, actually. Now, I do have uh, a recommendation and that's, um, you know, there are streamers out there that has a DAC built inside the streamer. Okay, there's standalone streamers where you need a separate DAC, which arguably could sound better or you can have a streamer that has a DAC built inside. And usually that's like the budget option. So I have two recommendations for you. Mm -hmm. So, um, and your budget is 4,200 USD. So that's pretty- No, 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 actually, actually no? it can stretch a little bit. Okay. If, if it's worth it, I can mm -hmm. stretch it a little bit. Well, you're not gonna have to stretch, stretch it at all and try to save you money here. So, <laughs> oh. but uh, so, so, you first of all, uh, I want to let everyone know. You told me that you like a you know more warmer musical sound um, yeah. rather than a colder or a brighter sound. Correct? Yes, correct. Okay. So my recommendation for you for the next step would be to get a Inuit Zen Mini Mark III. So I'll send you the model number uh, in text if you if you need the exact model. But again, it's called the Inuit Zen Mini Mark III. This retails for one thousand two hundred forty nine USD. Okay, so this is quite affordable. It has a DAC chip inside that is uh, uh, a little bit better than the um, DAC inside your Hegel. But that's not the important part. The important part is that the streaming capability of the Zen Mini Mark III is much better because Inuit is a strictly a streamer company. Thanks. And let me tell you how strictly they're, uh, you know, how strictly streamer of a company they are because their DAC, their power supply is all third party. It's made for them by different technicians from the industry. The only focus they have is making very good streamers and they do just that. So the Zen Mini, even though the price is you know, quite good, has a DAC inside as well, it's a very good streamer. Um, I've, by the way, uh, before I, sh I forgot to pay, uh, put the disclaimer. Uh, nothing I say is guessing work or, you know, un unless I say it's guessing work, right? Everything I recommend here is something that I heard directly, okay? So I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, guessing anything here. Now, I did hear, hear the Hegel H190 internal DAC um, and streamer versus having a separate Inuit feeding into the uh, Hegel H190. And the Zen, Zen Mini Mark III at $1,249 sounds much better than um, streaming just from the Hegel H190. So that's a recommendation that I can give if you want. And that overall uh, increases the resolution by quite a no noticeable amount. You will notice it right away. Um, it, it's a unit, all Zen, uh, all Inuit units are a little bit more warmer sounding, a little bit, um, you know, great bass authority as well. So that's something you will like. Now, now it also paves an upgrade path. Okay, so it's not like you buy the unit, it's done. Um, you can still add a second, you know, you can not, not a second DAC. Uh, you can add a separate DAC later on. So it still accepts other DACs as well. By, and it can, you can bypass the internal DAC in the Inuit Zen Mini Mark III later down on the line if you decide to go and do so and use it just as a streamer. Okay. Is this okay, all making so sense to you? Making a lot of sense. Okay. And I, I want to take advantage that I have you here <laughs> to yeah, ask sure. the next question because I am building an upgrade path. Mm hmm so if I want to go beyond that one mm -hmm. and I want to upgrade the next step of DAC mm -hmm. would be like what? Yes, we're, we're going to get to that. Um, oh. <laughs> but, be, but before, so, so, so you can add a separate DAC to the Zen Mini Mark III. You can even add the you know, Hegel H, HD30 later on to the Zen Mini and it will improve the sound because you're improving the DAC, the streamer stays the same. You can even add a separate power supply uh, for the Zen Mini Mark III for seven hundred dollars. Now I did do an A/B comparison. It's minimal difference, but there is a difference. And so if you are willing to take, 
you know, take that um, difference, then you can get the power supply. So there's upgrade options when you get the Zen Mini Mark III, which, you know, keeps you entertained. Um, the next, to answer your question, the next step, right, and I prepared this already because I know you're going to ask it. <laughs> Everyone asked that question. Um, the next step is uh, if someone, if you want to go a little bit beyond, which is getting the same brand, the newest Zen Mark III. So not the Zen Mini, but the Zen Mark III, which is the upper model. And that one retails for 6,600 USD. Now, this doesn't have a DAC inside. And in the entire line of the Inuit streamers, the Zen Mini Mark III is the only one that has a DAC inside. The Zen Mark III and up does not have a DAC inside. It's just the streamer. So you need a separate DAC with it. Okay. So what I would recommend as a DAC to go with the Zen uh, Mark III would be something like a Denifrips Ares II. Now, of course, you can go all out and buy the HD30 DAC for 4,200 plus the you know Zen, and that would be like a 10 grand right there. <laughs> um, will it sound better? It will. It will. But um, that that kind of uh, uh, that's something that you should work towards. But again, it, it will sound better. But you have to understand their stimulation return. It's not going to sound twice as better as what I'm recommending right here. Um, what I'm recommending you right here would be almost as good, like 90%. And the you know upgrading to that will be uh, like 10% or 15% increase if I have to put it in numbers. So a DAC that I would recommend uh, would be something like the Dana Phillips Aries 2, which is about $1,000, like I said. And uh, that DAC is not underrated, right? Um, it, it's been covered very well, but before it was quite underrated because it was covered by the Dana uh, Phillips uh, Terminator, DAC, uh, Terminator DAC, which is another option if you want to go that way as well. But their DACs, um, they're r 2 art base. They have that characteristic that you like. The Ares 2 adds a little bit more air around instruments, which I really like. And it will be a good balance with the Zen Mark III. So, and, uh, and if you add up the pricing, you know, 1,000 plus 2,600, 3,600, right? Still way below, well, not way below, but still below your, uh, you know, budget for the Hegel HD30. So that will actually significantly improve your system resolution, um, practically in every way possible. Base, resolution, depth, you know, sound state, everything will be improved um, in, in there. So I, you open another kind of worms because once you say the nephris, Mm -hmm. And uh, with the equipment I have, mm -hmm. how far can I get to improve on the DAC that it makes sense? For example, there's the Venus and then there's the Terminator. So where do you mm -hmm. think the Iris is enough or the Venus would? Um, I'm not sure if you heard all of them, actually. No, I haven't heard all of them. Um, but what I can tell you is that the Ares 2 is a good starting point, right? Um, you want to take your system. I know you're in Brazil, so it's a little bit harder. So you want to go, you know, go out in one go. But the Ares 2 is a really good DAC for its price category. That's why it won the best DAC award because my you know, channel is the, the next best thing studio. Um, and for it to... Uh, receive an award, you have to understand that it has to be above and beyond its price point in terms of performance, regardless of what price it is. If it's a $10,000 speaker, it needs to perform like something that I heard that's like $50,000, okay? It needs to be like that for it to win any type of award, right? Hegel didn't, uh, you know, unfortunately didn't get the award because while it's really, really great and, you know, it's to my taste, a fantastic deal and a fantastic thing, the price point right, is not going to perform as well as a $20,000 separate, right, because it's 4500 Canadian dollars here, so it's not going to be 20000 or $15,000 in performance per se, but, you know, it is great with certain gear like MagnaPan, for example, so th that's how the system works, so the Ares 2, you know, uh, you can compare it to even something like a $5,000 DAC, um, and that's a big statement to make, and you will still perform to that category when it comes to R2R DACs. Okay, um, to give you a reference, I reviewed the Socris DAC. I like the Ares 2 DAC much better than the Socris. And the Socris is much more expensive. Now, I hope Socris is not watching this, but anyways. 
<laughs> okay. Yeah. So, so does that answer your question? Is there any more follow-up? Yes. Yep. No, no. It, it answers my question. So okay. uh, then my next question would be, mm -hmm. the next logical step, uh, because I, I am aware mm -hmm. that I purchased an integrated amplifier. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, I am aware that the separate was much more expensive and a little bit out of my reach at the point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, does it make sense once I have the DAC and the streamer to think about the preamp, just thinking in, uh, in sound quality? Why I'm asking this? Mm -hmm. Because I'm really not connecting anything else, maybe the TV optical. Mm -hmm. which could go directly to the to the to the Hegel and mm -hmm. I don't know. So it always box always box me. Do I need a pre? Will it make it things better or is it not worth it? Because it's a an integrated amplifier. So are you saying you're gonna use the Hegel H one ninety as a just an amplifier and have a pre amplifier? Yes. Would that be a good idea or not? Now that won't work because the Hegel H190 also has a preamplifier inherently built into the system, mm -hmm. right? So you're going through two volume, uh, two preamps, right? And this is a classic scenario where uh, less is better. Okay. okay. So if you're going to get a separate preamplifier, then you might as well get a separate amplifier and sell your Hegel H190, which I know is not easy for you to do, but that will improve your system. Right, it will take it to a different level. Uh, it will cost you a lot more money, right? But it will take it to your uh, next level. But just adding a separate preamplifier to something that already has a built-in preamplifier, now you're going through two volumes, uh, you know, vol volume controls, and that always degrades sound quality. That always. But I was thinking. I was thinking more on in the line of the kind of product that it is like a digital preamplifier. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That no no uh, analog inputs, just uh, mm -hmm. optical input, mm -hmm. uh, maybe DAC streamer, something like the CIM Audio 390, mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think. So that kind of network amplifier, I was thinking. Uh, mm -hmm. Network, a digital preamplifier, I was thinking. Mm -hmm. So uh, my 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 thought is the same. Um, uh, even with digital preamplifiers, my my opinion is the same. Uh, when you're going out, going through two preamplifiers, right, or two amplifiers, it's to me that that's wrong. It should be an amplifier with one preamplifier, you know, with one DAC, right? Not two DACs, but one DAC. Um, so that that to me is where the phrase "less is better" is applicable, and okay. that's that's what I would I, I would save your money there in in the preamp, yeah. So I was gonna get sad, but then you said you're saving me money, so I'm, I'm not sad anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll tell you where to save money and where to actually spend money because you know that that can be cr uh, critical in your system um so so uh, next question or do you have any more questions yeah yes i have one more question sure uh, i have a quite uh very simple subwoofer mm -hmm. with that system mm -hmm. which is a clips I think it's about 300 watts. I think it, it used to belong to a bedroom home theater, something like that. And I just use it slightly yep. to reinforce a little bit the lowest base. Mm -hmm. And I am able to put it in a position and in a volume, connecting it to the, uh, to the, uh, to the output of the Hegel, mm -hmm. the variable output. Mm -hmm. And it blends very well. It blends so well that sometimes I don't know if the bass is coming from the subwoofer or from the speakers. Mm, yeah. So my question is, uh, is that, even though it's sounding fine, mm -hmm. but maybe I don't know how it would sound better, do I need to think in the future in a faster subwoofer, uh, to reinforce that, or it, it's mm. not worth it? So the Klipsch subwoofer is not necessarily a fast subwoofer, um, mm. or the most musical subwoofer, I should say. You know, I've used it myself for home theaters, and you know, my friends use it as well. Um, 
But if you, you know, you're the listener, right? Before you told me this, I was, uh, I wrote, I, I made a note saying that you should probably look at rail subwoofers because rail subwoofer matches the tonality of your amplifier. It's more seamless. You know, it's it's much more uh, coherent, right? It's like it's as if it's not there. But if you're already experiencing that with your current subwoofer, there's really no need for you to upgrade. Because you're the, think, you're the listener. I think something in the room is helping. Because <laughs> it could be. It's could in be. the corner. Yeah, it could be. And it is saving you money. So that's not yeah. that's not a problem. That's it's not a problem. And sometimes yeah. so it's, there's some sort of acoustic uh, mm -hmm. amplification going on there that with very low volume, I get significant bass. And yeah. it sounds good to me. Yeah. If it sounds good to you and if it's coherent and mm -hmm. you know you have no complaints with it then there's no real need for you to improve uh, upon that section of your system well yeah. if i ever want to go that direction you recommend mm -hmm. rail yeah if you ever do go in that direction i recommend rail uh, i currently use two t5i subwoofers that came in for review and they're very seamless they're probably one of the best subwoofers ever they're the they have a slogan, okay? They have, just like the NOS I mentioned to you, they have a, um, you know, they do one thing and one thing to perfection. You know, their, their, their thing is subwoofers. They don't do anything else, just subwoofers. And they've been doing this for a very long time and they focus on the art of subwoofers. I talked to the engineer, Andrew, um, multiple times and on, on multiple occasions um, and, you know, he, I never knew subwoofer technology can be that complicated. <laughs> I was on the phone with him once for like two hours, just going over, you know, what the T5i is capable of. And that's like a small subwoofer, right? Um, and it's, to, it's fascinating to me how a subwoofer like that uh, can really enhance your system because, and the, and, the, and the number one thing that you want from a subwoofer is like, you don't want to, you don't want to know it's there. When you play the music, you want it seamless, right? So you just don't want to know it's there. So if your subwoofer is already doing that, there's really no need for you to do that, right? The reason I recommend RHEL and you know people buy RHEL is they don't get that seamless presentation. Now I had a previously a older SVS subwoofer, and to me that was not seamless. Okay, no matter how I tweaked it, it was not seamless. It was a sealed subwoofer. It was an older model, granted. Um, probably that's why their current subwoofers are actually very good as well. But um, and it was actually you know not as seamless as I would have wanted to, especially because I was using a speaker like Magnapan or you know Meadowlark, which is a little bit more faster. And so I you know sold my SVS, and when the rail came came in, I was immediately blown away because the the integration was so seamless that I didn't even I was I had to check if the subwoofer was actually on, like the, the power. If it was gone bad, like I have to touch the subwoofer. And that's when you know, right, that the, the integration is really seem seamless. So if you're already getting that with your Klipsch, that is perfectly fine. That is, you know, that's great that you, you get that with your Klipsch. Um, so there's really no need, need for you to go down that road uh, just yet. Understood. You know, one of the major revelations coming from home theater, mm -hmm. and having actually a very good home theater, Mm -hmm. I have KF reference for the old ones, big, big towers, mm -hmm. the PBS uh, subwoofer mm -hmm. and the technology, whatever. Mm -hmm. And then I have B amplified with external Yamaha. And actually, music didn't sound bad. No, no, no. no. It, it, it shouldn't. Bad. It shouldn't. <laughs> but, but coming from there mm -hmm. to the simple system I have now, mm -hmm. I realized I wasn't hearing probably 25% of the things that were happening. Mm -hmm. And I, I am not a professional musician, but I, I play badly several <laughs> instruments. Yeah. Enough to know how they sound, enough mm -hmm. to know how coherent it should sound when it is played live. Yeah. And, and, and it was actually rediscovering the music I loved Mm -hmm. Finding out, wow, there's a bass line here. Wow, there's a choir here. I never imagined there was somebody talking at the same time he was thinking. Yeah. It, was, it was rediscovering the, the whole music again, and I realized how much I was missing. 
That's great. That's great. Yeah. That, I mean, that's what we're here for, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, and coherence when you are watching a movie. I mean, who knows how an explosion sounds? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I don't care about the movies. You know, I just got a new projector. Um, you know, I got a second hand. And my friend Tujan just brought it to me before this interview. We just set it up. So I may watch something tonight. But, you know, it's the explosion and stuff. It's just like... You know, it, it's it's a wow effect, right? So it needs to be big. It needs to, you know, punch. But no one's going to be like, oh, how fast is the speed of that punch sounding, right? So, so it's a different or thing. Or watching the movie five times to compare the explosions through different right. weapons. It, it, it's, it's more it about sense. pure output. It's more about pure exactly. output rather than the quickness or the musicality of the subwoofer. So there's uh, subwoofers for music and then subwoofers for movies. And uh, that's totally different, right? Yeah. Okay, so the next one mm -hmm. is a can of worms. I know because I've read it <laughs> about it on the internet. Uh -huh. And at first, let me tell you the story. Sure. Very brief. Uh, I was literally using electrical lamp cords. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> literally to yep. connect my previous, uh, not the home theater, but the, the, the previous system I had with an old AVR, etc. Mm -hmm. So I was in the Brazilian version of Craigslist, mm -hmm. and I saw some guy that was an artisan that he made the cables, and I ordered speaker cables from him. The I don't know what brand, but they look good. They are thick. The, the terminations are very fine. The handcraft is very fine. And, of course, I am going, like, from <laughs> a lamp wire to this cable and by wire. And I was like, wow, <laughs> there was such a difference. I don't know if it was because of the cable, the by wire or the combination, but I was convinced, yes, they make a difference and it is audible. Yeah. So <laughs> now comes the, the, the next questions, which has a part A and part B. Part A, what would be the reasonable cable, a brand model, etc., to use. And the part B, once you have a quality cable, by wiring in short distances makes still makes a difference or not? Okay. So A, um, so you already have a custom made cable that's yes. working, you know, it's an audio cable. Now, one of the things that uh, is really not arguable is, you know, sorry people on the internet, is using lamp cord versus an actual cable made for audio. Whether it be $20, $10, $5, I don't care. You, when you buy, you can test this right out right now for people, you know, that's, that's watching. You can test this right now. You can go out, right, to, to your Home Depot or whatever, buy lamp wire, right? You can buy really cheap, right? Use that and then buy audio cable from Home Depot, which is, again, cheap, right? And then compare the two. I've done it and it makes a difference. So, and it's not a small difference. It's actually going from like, you know, sounding like absolute horse shit to, you know, actually music, right? So, <laughs> so there is a difference when you use a non-audio cable versus an audio cable. And I think that's what you experienced. Yep. Now, the next move is not going to be as drastic as what you've experienced in the past. That is a given. But you can um, uh, get more better uh, speaker cables. But it's the last thing you should ever upgrade in your system. Okay. Okay. It's the last, absolutely the last thing. When you're satisfied with your system, when you say, this is it, I'm not going to get any more things. I want to finalize everything, then I would get a speaker cable. And I'm not talking about $10,000, $20,000 cables, right? I'm not even talking about, yeah, I'm, I'm not even talking about a $1,000 cable. What I'm talking about is using a quality cable that is built well to last, okay? Because the last thing you want is to have a, you know, $20,000, $30,000 system and then have a cable go bad and you later realize that your cable was ruining the system 
because that does happen, you know, through oxidation, through multiple factors over years, this happens and I've seen it happen, right? Um, so you have no idea how many times I visit clients or, you know, friends' houses, they tell me, oh, you know, something's wrong with my system and it's the cable. The first thing I check is the cable because there's some interconnect somewhere that has, you know, been used and abused and, you know, the jack is coming off and, you know, the solder is, you know, bad. There are cases like that. So you want to, first of all, a very good build quality for the best bang for the buck, you know, best uh, uh, value. And uh, you want to have, you know, good material, good conductors, right? Good, you know, just reasonable uh, uh, quality, right? That's not going to diminish your system that's, you know, that you, inve you invest a lot of money in. So, and we're talking about like a hundred dollar cable here. We're not talking about a thousand dollar cable. And what I would recommend, and I personally use this, is color copper cables. And this is a Chinese, you know, it's coming from China. It's built, um, but the parts are all, all, all over the countries like USA, UK. So, and I can, um, the cables are very well built. And uh, when I say well built, I mean, as in like well built to like about if I compare it to like a thousand dollar two thousand dollar cable here right in most cases the color copper will win in terms of build quality wow. it is extremely well made um I was quite surprised looking at it going like this is 100 bucks um so that I use that for my RCA interconnects XLR interconnects power cables <laughs> Uh, power cables are thick. Um, now that may become a problem if you have limited space, obviously. But again, um, power cables are thick. You know, um, the speaker cables are very nicely made, build quality looks nice, right? Which is another factor. And you know, that's what I would recommend. And it's, and it's like under a hundred dollars in most cases. Like the speaker cables, like together for the pair, and I have like two meters or something. Uh, you know, two point five meters or something. I it's, it's like it's like two hundred dollars or something like that. So it depends. On, yeah, you buy online. It, it's shipped to you. So that's one way to go about it. The next thing, if you're like, oh, you know, I don't want to buy from China. That's not you know, it's coming from other side of the country. It's gonna take a long time. You need it now, or you know, you want an American brand. Then the closest thing is AudioQuest, but that's going to cost you. Uh, quite a bit of money and it's not going to look as nice uh, but the sound is going to be practically on par and that's like the you know uh, you can go with the entry audio quest cables but that has like a very industrial kind of like studio <laughs> use kind of jacket um, and I believe that's like the type 4 type 8 right you can go above and beyond um, to something like the water or uh, fire, right? Um, that's what they call it, the cables. It's called water and fire. And that's like the quality, build quality you'll get from this $100 cable, right? In comparison uh, to the AudioQuest. The AudioQuest fire and water is about like, here it's about like 1,000, 2,000 or, or more. So, wow. yeah, but but it's most, and, and the good thing about both of these cables, and I have to say, you know, AudioQuest is made in USA and they're, they're you know, they're cable manufacturers, so props to them. But um, both of them are very neutral cables. Okay, the AudioQuest and the cable that I use now is quality uh, and it's neutral. And that's what I recommend for any system, really, is to get your system right. You know, the last thing that you do for your system um, is get cables. And if you have to get a warm sounding cable or you know, a brighter sounding cable, right? Then there's something wrong with your system. You don't like your system, right? And you want the new, most neutral cable possible, in my opinion, and that's just the way I look at it. You know, maybe someone has different opinions, but at the most possible, you know, get the most neutral cables for the you know, best build quality you possibly can get for the price. That's the general rule of thumb. Even if you don't believe in sound, for those of you watching, right? Even if you don't believe in sound, that's that's the general rule of thumb. The most inexpensive cable for the best build quality. You know, that's pretty reasonable, I think. Um, and, you know, pretty, pretty um, uh, and, that's, and that's how I would go about it. There's no more, nothing more to it. And, but that's still, um, you should keep your 
current cables and upgrade to a different cable once you have everything perfectly set up. Okay, so uh, when I'm connecting, when I'm doing the interconnects, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's these things about noise and mm -hmm. turf so mm -hmm. messing with that. So XLR or RCA? Okay, so first of all, noise with cables, that has been addressed in the 21st century or before the 21st century, right? It, it's not an issue anymore. Like people figure that out. Like, you know, there's, there's no noise issues for the most part. If there's noise issues, it's usually grounding or from the wall um, in the house. It's not from the actual cables. And if it's actually the cables is, you know, dysfunctional, it's, um, it's, it's a broken cable. It's not from the inherent design is what I'm trying to say. So okay. that's pretty much taken care of. Now, the question of RCA to XLR. Now, RCA in short length, the general rule of thumb is RCA in short length is what I use. So I'm talking about 1.5 meter, 2 meter around there, then use RCA. If you need to go past that, then I would start using XLR. And the reason for this is because the XLR has an extra grounding and it's, you know, used in studios are a very long lengths, right? When I record downstairs uh, uh, my YouTube videos, I use a Sennheiser boom microphone and I use XLR and that XLR is really long, right? Because it's going plugging into my audio recorder. Now, I get a reasonable build quality again with the most <laughs> neutral cable that I can find in these uh, pro world, right? But I don't go, you know, oh, I must have, you know, RCA or a single ended, you know, uh, cable at shorter lengths. There's nothing like that. Studio is like all XLR. And that's because they can't afford, not necessarily to reduce noise so much, but it's, it's because you have to understand pro studios, right? They, they can't afford to go get something wrong, right? There's no room for something to go wrong and find out later. So they use XLR so that there is inherently no problem when there's uh, longer lengths of cables happening. So that's why uh, for longer lengths, XLR is beneficial. That is 100% you know, proven. RCA, shorter lengths, I personally find it more musical. For some reason, I don't know why. I've tested this. I just find it more musical. As shorter lengths, RCA seems to be 98% of the time, I would say more musical. Sure. When compared to you know the same brand, the same model line, you know, just different connectors type of thing. Um, now, I guess the other question you had was by wiring. And now that's a very uh, tricky question because by wiring is really, been, uh, it, it can be beneficial depending on the system. Mm. So I've heard systems where they used by wiring and it made no difference, like none, <laughs> zero, like, didn't even know that happened. And I heard systems where by wiring actually took effect and really improved the system. So that is a hard question to answer. It depends on your system. And if by wiring has improved your system, then go with by wiring. You know, mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't hurt. You just remove the plates or whatever on the connectors you already have, and then you plug in all the cables, right? For me, it was immediately noticeable like some air and separation among the instruments. Mm -hmm. Sound stage got a little bit bigger. Mm -hmm. it, it definitely was noticeable, noticeable right away. Yeah. So, so if it's not noticeable for you, then you, you should do it. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. So uh, in case I decide to go separate, mm -hmm. in what direction should I go? When you go to separates, it's a whole different story because now you have um, multiple possibilities, right? You can go with multiple different brands, but if you like the sound of Hegel, and yep. I believe you do, then you should be looking at the Hegel separate amplifier. Now, the easiest way would be going with a Hegel preamplifier, right? Um, that would be the easiest way to get the synergy perfectly because it's, a, it's from the same company. But if you want to add a, a taste of tube, amp, a tube preamplifier, which you've mentioned, then you can get the Hegel amplifier and then get a preamplifier like the ModRite LS100, which is the one I have. Um, you can also get something like Audible Illusion. Now, 
audible illusion drives tubes quite harder than other tube preamplifiers, from my understanding. I'm not a designer, just a disclaimer. So from my understanding, it drives the preamplifier tubes a little bit harder. So I kept spares. Um, and the great thing about audible illusion is that it has that beautiful tube characteristic in the mid range. Nobody can miss it. The modroid is a little bit more refined. It's a little bit more modern sounding with that tube, go tube thing going on. Um, and the other option is if you want something smaller and you know excellent quality, there's uh, the, um, what's that brand um, that I just reviewed? LTA, Linear Tube Audio, MZ3. So that's a really good uh, tube preamplifier as well. And that has that kind of you know, beautiful mid-range, just like the Audible Illusion. So there's many tube preamplifiers that sound to be and good, and that can add that kind of characteristic to the uh, to the Hegel amplifier. Um, it's really hard for people to go wrong with tube preamplifiers, right? Um, it, just like tube amplifiers, tube preamplifiers, right? It's easier than making a solid state amplifier because of because of the inherent uh, characteristic of its distortion levels. I, I know I'm abusing your time, but no it, problem. It went so fast because it was so no problem. Entertaining. You, don't to, you, don't, you don't have to. You don't have to look at the time. Just uh, keep <laughs> asking. I believe I, I, you answered all my questions. Now I want to make uh, an, another question, but it's more like your opinion. Sure. Did I did I mess up with the speakers I bought? Like no, the first question I should really ask you is: You said you you listen to all type of music. Yep. That speaker is good for all type of music. So you made the right choice there. Now, the the next question I need to ask you is, do you like what you hear from your speakers? Yeah. Then you didn't mess up. Okay. It doesn't matter what I say, really, right? <laughs> I could say it's the shittiest speaker in the world, but if you like it, then you like it. And that's what it matters. No, no but uh, I was uh, afraid that maybe it would something like, oh, it's not bad. Actually, it's good. X is better. But in this world of audio, there's always better. There's always How better. better. And your speakers are already your, your speakers are already a very, you know, highly regarded, you know, uh, high end speaker. So I don't think that you should necessarily change your you know, speakers. Now, the general rule of thumb is, you know, if you funny thing is, if you ask a speaker designer, Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, what should I? I mean, what should I spend most of my money on? They say speakers. If you ask an amplifier engineer, then they say, get the you know least amount of uh, spend the least amount on the speakers. Get the you know get a sound that you like and buy a speaker for X amount of dollars and spend like eighty percent or fifty percent of your budget on the amplifier. Right. So they want to spend you, you to spend more money on the amplifier, and that's not you know they're, they're not. They're biased, but they're not uh, dishonest because they are in that business. You have to understand they're in that business, the amplifier making business or the speaker making business uh, because they believe that that's what makes the most difference. Okay. Right. Um, but the interesting thing is when I talk to some speaker designers, some of them actually say the amplifier. Mm -hmm. So my belief is that uh, get a good set of speakers that you can possibly afford, not the cheapest, that sounds okay, but get a good pair of speakers that sounds really good to your ears. And maybe you, you know, have expensive ears. Maybe <laughs> you, you're not satisfied with, uh, you know, $500 speakers. But if you do, then that's perfectly fine. Get something, and you already have it, but this is for the general public, right? Get something that is quite good to your ears, that you're satisfied with, that you can live with, and then get a component that is um, a little bit above that speaker level. That's what I would recommend because that will really, you know, bring out everything the speakers are capable of. So is, is that component the uh, HD20, no, the, the, the Hegel, the amplifier, the 20 mm -hmm. or the 30? Yeah, tw tw the 20. You can you can go for the thirty if you want, but that's like sixteen thousand Canadian. So it's, just... <laughs> it's, it's, I know, it's too much for my listening room. Actually, yeah. the the those Epicons already sound 
bigger than they are. Yeah. They sound yeah. almost like towers to me. Yeah. And yeah. I know what a big tower sounds like. Yeah. yeah. So speakers, you know, you can do a lot of things. Uh, you can always switch around. Um, but at the end of the day, if you want to improve upon your system and you're happy with the sound of your speakers, right? It's another thing if you, you know, if you, if you're like me and you listen to a speaker and you hear like the caveats, you know, because I you're used to finding caveats with a speaker. If you hear, you know, the level, you know, when I hear a set of speakers, right, I, I it builds in my mind the category it's in in terms of its performance. So if that's like you, then you know, I'm 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 spoiled because I listen to a lot of high end stuff, right? I'm not I'm not trying to be, you know, you know, saying that it's actually pretty sad for me because I'm not able to afford you know, a hundred thousand dollar or half a million dollar system, but that's what I like. Anything else is, wow, this is really good for the money, but that's not what satisfies me. What satisfies me is, you know, something that's not really good for the money. <laughs> something that is worthless for the money, right? It's just like, you know, that's not worth it. That's like, you know, you have to win the lottery, right? That's what satisfies me, unfortunately. So it's a different story. But if you find a speaker that's really to your taste, right? It's like getting a home. Right. Think of it this way. You're getting a home that you really like the construction. You like the interiors. You like how it looks on the outside, on the inside. Now, all you have to do is fill the furniture inside with, you know, better and nice uh, decorations. So that's what you're doing with your speakers to build upon the uh, capabilities of your system. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Jay, Other thank questions? You a lot. No, you killed all my questions already. <laughs> That's great. <laughs>